We are almost to the end of First Samuel. I know, you're probably like, yeah, that's so weird, even though we've been doing it for like, I don't know, months. But it's good because um, if, if you were to go back to the original scriptures, um, <clears throat> can you grab the door? Can one of you guys grab the door and make sure it's closed? Um, <clears throat> If you go back to the, to the old Holy Scriptures, and what I'm talking about here is the original Masoretic text, which is the original Hebrew, or the Septuagint, which is the <coughs> Greek version of the Old Testament, the books of Samuel and Kings are all put together into sometimes one entire book, sometimes two books. Um, <clears throat> the Septuagint, call, it was two books. First and Second Samuel, first and Second Kings were called kingdoms. Well, today, in our modern English translations, we have four books that have been broken up. So it's really not right to say 1 Samuel is its own book. I mean, you get the clue. It's already, it's a one, right? So there's a second one to come at least. Um, and so I think what we're going to do is just keep going. Um, we will probably finish next week. So we'll do, uh, what is it, 27 and 28 today. We'll do 29 and 30. And you know, probably 31 next week because I don't want to have an, an odd week. <clears throat> And 31 isn't very long. And then I think we'll just keep going into 2 Samuel. And, and what I don't want to be is like Buzz Killington and have like the big cliffhanger for David and his life and then not come back to him for like years. So I think we'll just keep going. <clears throat> but uh, what we're doing is wrapping up kind of the, the first part of David's life today, which is David on the run. <clears throat> and let's just, let's just review where we're at. Now, I know this may not look like a map to you. It is a map. There's a lot of writing. There is some, some drawings, which may be a clue that it's a map. This squiggly thing here, the Dead Sea, the lowest point on the continents of Earth, <coughs> the Sea of Galilee, which is not called the Sea of Galilee yet. It's uh, Chinneroth right now, <coughs> which means harp, <coughs> because it kind of looks like a harp. This looks nothing like a harp. Uh, I, apparently, the sea does look like a harp or the shape of a harp. We have Canaan which is also coming to be known now as Israel. But you have to remember that Israel is as much a cultural definition as it is a physical place definition. So today, we are blessed with the fact that there is a nation of Israel. There hasn't been a nation of Israel for 2,500 years. You have to remember that even in the time of Jesus, this was not the nation of Israel. This was a region <clears throat> that was controlled by Romans. Um, uh, Judea. Judea is the sector that, uh, that existed during the time of Jesus, but there has not been a nation of Israel for 2,500 years until the 1940s um, in the modern era. So this is slowly becoming a nation, a physical nation co-located called Israel, but it's still Canaan. It's still the region of Canaan. You told the band to be quiet, right? You said, can you just keep it down, guys? Can I go forward, please? Thank you. Next to Canaan or Israel is the mortal enemy of the Israelites in the Iron Age, which is the Philistines or Philistia. Philistia is a fertile plain. Now, I haven't drawn mountains and anything like that because it's impossible, but here you have a very flat plain, which is very fertile. There's a lot of crop growing here. Um, they have access to the sea, which is vitally important uh, economically and militarily. And then you have these, these mountains or hills, the Judean hills, hill country. And this is where mostly the people of Yahweh have settled. Um, the Philistines up to this point have been a far superior military people. They have mastered the use of iron. Remember, we are just in the kind of the, the semi beginnings of what we call the Iron Age. There are ages associated with antiquity, which kind of gives a clue to the technology being used. Stone Age, what's the primary weapon of the Stone Age? It's not hard. <laughs> See, I give you the easy stuff. Yeah, it's rocks. It's stone. Uh, it's, it's stone axes and hand axes and things made of stone that are shaped into tools and then used, usually to bludgeon each other or to kill animals or to do work. <coughs> and then there's the Bronze Age. Bronze is an alloy of copper and tin that is far superior to stone in the sense that you can make it into very specific tools, weapons, uh, shields, armor, um, all, all kinds of implements that can help to do work, but bronze is not very strong in the sense that um, it's stronger than not having it, it's stronger than a stick. <clears throat> but soon humans have learned to harness the power of iron and iron working. <clears throat> and in a sense, combining iron with carbon to make what? Steel. Steel, which is even much stronger than iron. And so the Philistines have largely 
mastered that technology. Now, if you're in battle and you have an iron sword or a steel sword and your opponent has a bronze helmet, what's gonna happen when that steel sword hits that bronze helmet? You ever seen a melon get, sorry, <laughs> gross. And we have young people here. It's not pretty. The steel is far superior to the bronze and it's harder and it's stronger and you can make vehicles out of it. Another technology the Philistines have mastered here is the, uh, the car, the automobile of the Iron Age, which is what? Chariots. 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 You can actually make a vehicle pulled by a horse or a donkey or, or what have you, and you can ride around very high speeds. A chariot is great for flat land. Where is flat land here? <laughs> In Philistia. Okay, so they have a great highway and network of places where they can go on their chariots and they can get there very fast, they can use them in battle. Where is a chariot really awful to use? In the mountains. <laughs> Good luck getting a chariot up a mountain, right? Now we all have heard the stories of the settlers of the wild west of the United States trying to pull their wagons with their ox and horse pulled wagons over the Sierra Nevada. How well did that work out? <laughs> it was horrible. Most of the ox died. The, w the wagon wheels would get caught in ruts and ravines or on the side of a mountain and they would have to haul them up. It's horrible. It's a terrible way to travel over mountainous terrain. Um, so it was largely completely ameliorated by fighting in the Judean hills. This is why the Israelites were able to kind of get going. Though they were far outmatched in their, their military and technological uh, advancements, they were able to get a foothold in the mountains and, and really grow their culture until they had come up to equivalence with the technology of the Philistines. Why am I talking about all this weird stuff? Because it actually has a lot to do with what we're going to read today. <clears throat> now, let's rewind where we're at with David. David is the son of Jesse, who is from Bethlehem, and here I have Jerusalem, which is not actually called Jerusalem yet, let's just pretend. <clears throat> and there's a tiny town just south of Jerusalem that's really important for Christians, and what is that town? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Beth it's gonna be Christmas, guys, come on, Bethlehem. Now, David has been anointed by Samuel, the last judge of Israel, as the next king of Israel. Who is the king on the throne as we pick up our story today? Saul. Saul. Here's my timeline. This is, this is for the young people as much as anything. 2000 BC. So what is this year? 2020, 2020 AD, right? Anno Domine, the year of our Lord, 2020. That means it is right here. If I were to draw the timeline out, we are right here right now in 2020 AD. Rewind the clock. 2,000 years. We're in the time of Jesus. So this is where there's, there's no zero. There's 1 BC or 1 AD. Jesus probably born around 4 BC. I know it's weird. It messes with your head. I'll explain it later. Go another 2,000 years. So now we're 4,000 years in the past. This is the time of the patriarchs, the time of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, the fathers of the Israelite nation. Now go forward in time. We have the Exodus around 1450, and then the period of the judges. And now we arrive at the period of what we're talking about in 1 Samuel, which is around 1000 BC, so th still 3000 years ago. But here is what we're talking about. Saul is the king of Israel, the first king of Israel. He has lost his favor with God. And God has said, I'm going to replace you. You have not done what I've told you to do. You have acted selfishly and you're a wicked king. And I'm going to kick you off the throne and I'm going to replace you with someone else. And that someone else has already been anointed to become the successor of Saul and that is David. <clears throat> Here's the problem. What happens when you have two kings? <laughs> How well does that go over? Two presidents, two Caesars. <laughs> Right? History is replete with examples where you can't have two people in charge. It just doesn't work. King, king elect and king See, that's where I was going. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. And what happens? Saul, knowing this is a threat and acting selfishly, has now tried to kill David on multiple occasions. He's decided David is his rival, and he will do anything he can to kill his rival. So where is David? Is David hanging out in the same town? As Saul in this period? No way. They're not friends. 
They're not even close, and David is on the run. And today we see David on the run. <clears throat> and I'll just say it this way. And that picks us up here with where we're going to start today. And I do ask for a volunteer. Let's read 1 Samuel 27. <coughs> I will just kick things off. And that will be 1 to 12. Look how easy this is. Softball, 1 to 12. Who would like to read that for me? I can. Thank you. Man. Then David said in his heart, Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. So David arose and went over, he and six hundred men who were with him, to Ashish, the son of Moat, king of Gath. And David lived with Ashish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel, and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow. And when it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer sought him. Then David said to Ashish, If I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be given me in one of the country towns that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So that day, Ashish gave him to Ziklag. Therefore, Lester, you thought this was going to be easier. I don't know. Great. 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 <laughs> Therefore, Ziklag had belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. The number of the days that David lived in the country with the Philistines was a year and four months. Now David and his men went up and made raids against the Geshurites and Gerzites and the Malachites, for these were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as far as Shur to the land of Egypt. And David would strike the land and would leave neither man nor woman alive, but would take away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the garments, and come back to Ashish. When Ashish asked, Where have you made a raid today? David would say, Against the Nijeb of Judah or against the Jeb of Malites or against the Nijeb of the Kentites and David would leave neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath thinking at least lest they should tell about us and say so David has done such was his custom all the while he lived in the country of the Philistines and Ashish trusted David, thinking, He has made himself an utter stench to his people, Israel. Therefore, he shall always be my servant. Now, I want you all to be good little Hebrews. I, we need to learn how to, you know, <coughs> Hebrew is all guttural. It's in the throat. Yeah. <laughs> okay, everyone practice. Okay, on three. One, two, three. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Achish. <laughs> Achish. <laughs> so, this is great. Um, what, what's going on here? Tell me... Tell me what is actually happening here. What do you take from this chapter? Oh, David's fighting a lot. There's a lot, a lot of, of fighting. People. That's good. I like this. Okay. <clears throat> Why is he killing so many people? A lot of fighting. Why? Why? Well, it's kind of like he's doing what he would have done as king, but he gets to do it before he is actually a Officially. This is brilliant. Like on the brand. This is brilliant. And, and you have to give David credit. And I don't think anyone who acknowledge, you know, uh, there's some people that say there was no such thing as David. They're, they're, they're completely out of their mind. There, actually, there absolutely was a man named David who ended up being king of the Israelites of a united monarchy. There is no question in my mind and in others' minds who believe that David was real, that David was a brilliant military commander. There is no doubt. <clears throat> Um, in fact, he was so brilliant and so good at warfare that even God himself said, bro, don't worry about building that temple. You have too much blood on your hands. You did a great job doing exactly what I wanted you to do, but I'm going to have your son Solomon build my temple for me because I want it to be holy and sacred and not, not uh, part of the, the blood that you've, you've spilled. But he did it um, <clears throat> he, in many ways for God and for what he was asked to do. 
Um, he is doing exactly what he would have done as king, but he is, he is working, working for the Philistines here. When I say working in air quotes, what am I saying? Well, he's feigning loyalty. Yeah. And, the, and, you know, these groups that he's killing, you know, they're enemies of both sides, yes. of Israel and the Philistines. I mean, these are marauders yep. that are going around ruthlessly killing yep. anybody. So David's just kind of wiping the bad guy out anyway and getting, you know, brownie points from Achish. <laughs> nice. That's good. That's good. Maybe it's our German roots, too. Yeah. <laughs> he's also learned his lesson from when he okay. did it. Like when he went to go th get the showbread, and that guy was there. I forget yeah. what his name was, and, uh, and then he went and told mm -hmm. on him to yeah, Doeg. Doeg, yeah, the Edomite. That's right. <laughs> um, and then he told on him, and then all these people ended up dying mm -hmm. in that town because David had left him alive and didn't like. Okay. You know, so he's kind of learned, and also Saul was supposed to wipe all these people out, and yes. then Saul didn't do it, and. He lost his favor with God, so I think he's mm -hmm. learning from past mistakes and from mm -hmm. mistakes of other people. What else is David doing? Remember what I said at the very beginning. There was a point to my rambling. At the beginning, we're talking about David in a society that is really backwards. They are really poor, physically, technologically, militarily. They're just kind of a bunch of thugs living in caves that would run out and, and bash you on the head and run back to their cave. This is the Israelites of the period. The Philistines are far different people. Efficient, well-organized, highly technological. What is David learning in the year that he spent with Achish? Trade secrets. Trade secrets. He is learning everything that the enemy knows. I keep my friends close and my Enemies closer. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> David is doing his internship with his mortal enemy, and his mortal enemy is letting him do it the entire time. <clears throat> what else do you take from this passage? <clears throat> he doesn't have to run anymore, really. I think, uh, yep. He's got somebody that is his enemy, but he's mm -hmm. in his good graces. How does that speak to David, not just as a brilliant military commander, but as a talker? He yeah. talked his way into his enemy's fortress, and now he's working for him. Give me a whole city. He got a city, And that was bro. the guy who he feigned insanity earlier. Very good. And so Achish either uh -huh. overlooked this, or obviously, I mean, you wouldn't think he'd think forget I'm, it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so David not didn't just talk his way into mm -hmm. a neutral area. <laughs> he convinced the guy who he once convinced he was insane <clears throat> that he's okay again. Isn't that something? Now what does Achish think he's getting out of this? Now it's not just one-sided. David isn't the only one benefiting here. What does Achish think he's getting out of all this? He's got a great an warrior. Yeah. An enemy of his enemy. And, and what is he seeing the writing on the wall of Saul? You better believe he can see the writing on the wall. Saul's not going to last forever. Saul's days are numbered. And what happens when Saul's gone? Got my so buddy here. His buddy's going to take my over. My buddy's taking yeah. over, bro. What? <laughs> Bachelor party. Yeah, also in this passage, evidently it's okay <clears throat> to lie again. You know, David is, is being deceitful and lying. Um, now it, it's done in... You know, the, he probably would <coughs> justify it, and I would probably agree mm -hmm. that it's done in warfare. Mm -hmm. Do you think that he was? Now, I will say this. First of all, I think 100%, if you grew up in the church and you went to Sunday morning, Sunday school as a child, you would never were told the whole story of the people of God. There was plenty your Sunday school teacher left out. One of them is, and the biggest one of all, is the infallibility, or I'm sorry, the fallibility or the human-like qualities of the people of God. They were all broken, lying, degenerate people to some degree, who God picked to do great things for God. David is not the most perfect human that's ever walked the earth by any stretch of the imagination. And, and we're going to get into this next week, actually, when we talk about plunder again. <clears throat> 
There are many times when David did things that were either questionable or outright wrong. Yes, he lies sometimes. He, he has many wives. He shouldn't have that. Um, <clears throat> sometimes he takes plunder when he shouldn't. Um, now, it's a good question here. Was he really lying? Sometimes, maybe, maybe not. You have to remember, too, um, David is also trying to fix the problems of Israel um, before he goes on the throne. And there could be opportunities where he knows there's corruption within the, his own people, and he wants to root that out, too. Um, he may have also known that he was never going to have to fight them. Um, and, and I'm giving it away for the future. Um, but, but I think this is totally right, Steve. David is a complex fellow. He's a complex fellow. And just because he, he does something or says something doesn't necessarily mean God endorses it. When was this written? You have a huge clue in verse 6. What is verse 6? Read it to me again. It says that Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah ever since, and David lived in the Philistine land a year and four months. What do you mean the kings of Judah? Who are the kings of Judah? Yeah, that hasn't happened yet. We don't even have kings of Judah yet. That won't even happen for another 80 years. Folks, we are right at the beginning of the United Monarchy. Well, we're towards the middle. We're towards the middle of the United Monarchy, <clears throat> somewhere around 1000 BC. After Saul, David will reign uncontested as the ruler of the 12 tribes of Israel. And remember, that includes Judah, which is this little chunk here, and then essentially the other 11 tribes that are all spread around him. Only after Solomon dies, does that united kingdom get broken into two? A northern half of, of so-called ten tribes that we call Israel, which is confusing, <coughs> and a southern two tribes of Judah. There isn't going to be a, a Judah or kings of Judah for another 40 to 80 years. So when would you say that this was written? Actually written down pen to paper, or pen to papyrus. <coughs> Later. Sometime before 586, sometime before Judah itself is destroyed by the Babylonians. This is a great clue, folks. And, and again, remember, a lot of it could be written down in chunks first. And that's probably what happened. And again, you know, I make a big deal about how the Bible was written because it's really important. There is no doubt that Samuel himself or his scribes wrote a lot of the content that you're, ended, you're reading here, <clears throat> at least up to the time of Samuel. But then that was mixed with additional content. David himself obviously wrote quite a bit of content. In fact, we have a lot of David's writings where in the Bible? Psalms. Psalms. Yeah, say it loud and proud, bro. <laughs> Psalms. That's a lot. The Psalms are a lot of the content of the Old Testament. <clears throat> so obviously he's writing content and he's adding to this. So a lot of people probably over time contributed pieces or chunks of this narrative that later it seems during the divided monarchy were finally coalesced into the content that you have here, at least for 1 Samuel. All right. I, I found it <clears throat> interesting that all of David's men and their households, I mean, they just, yeah. like, it seems odd to me that he's going running from Saul this whole time, and he takes 600 men and yeah. their wives mm -hmm. and kids and donkeys and camels and everything else yep. with them, that doesn't seem like a very good way to hide, mm -hmm. you know, traveling with 1,500 people or whatever. When he was traveling in Israel, there is no mention of the families being with them. And, and so I would assume, and probably wrongly so, that at least during the early period when he was on the run, it probably just was the men. And in fact, when you talk about him showing up at the, at the you know, um, tabernacle and saying, I need the showbread, for me and my men, um, it doesn't really, you know, it allude to anything like, and my kids are starving too. It seems at some point he was on the run with just his men, but when he settled in Philistia, probably seemed like it was safe, and so they brought their families with them. Yeah, there was some normalcy there. That, yeah. yeah just, come on over here. I mean, it just, it just yeah. struck me as like, that seems kind of It's weird. weird. Yeah. It's weird. Okay. Anything else? Let's go ahead and read chapter 28. 
First Samuel, the Witch of Endor. No, not with Ewoks. <clears throat> One to twenty-five. Who would like to read that for me? I can read it. Later, the Philistines gathered their armies to fight against Israel. Eight. He <laughs> said to David, you understand that you and your men must join my army. So David answered, you will see for yourself what I, your servant, can do. So Ashish said, fine, I'll make you my permanent bodyguard. Now Samuel was dead and all the Israelites had shown their sadness for him. They had buried Samuel in his hometown of Ramah. And Saul had forced out the mediums and fortune tellers from the land. The Philistines came together and made camp at Shunem. Saul gathered all the Israelites and made camp at Gilboa. When he saw the Philistine army, he was afraid, and his heart pounded with fear. He prayed to the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him through dreams, Urim, or prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, so I may go and ask her what will happen. His servants answered, There is a medium in Endor. Then Saul put on other clothes to disguise himself, and at night he and two of his men went to see the woman. Saul said to her, Talk to a spirit for me. Bring up the person I name. But the woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done. He has forced the mediums and fortune tellers from the land. You are trying to trap me and get me killed. Saul made a promise to the woman in the name of the Lord. He said, As surely as the Lord lives, you won't be punished for this. The woman asked, Who do you want me to bring up? He answered, Bring up Samuel. When the woman saw Samuel, she screamed. She said, Why have you tricked me? You are Saul. The king said to the woman, Don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a spirit coming up out of the ground. Saul asked, What does he look like? The woman answered, An old man wearing a coat is coming up. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed face down on the ground. Samuel asked Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul said, I am greatly troubled. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has left me. He won't answer me anymore, either by prophets or in dreams. And that's why I called for you. Tell me what to do. Samuel said, The Lord has left you and become your enemy, so why do you call on me? He has done what he said he would do, the things he said through me. He has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given, given it to one of your neighbors, David. You did not obey the Lord. You did not show the Amalekites how angry he was with them, and that is why he has done this to you today. The Lord will hand over both Israel and you to the Philistines. Tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will hand over the army of Israel to the Philistines. Saul quickly fell flat on the ground and was afraid of what Samuel had said. He was also very weak because he had eaten nothing all that day and night. Then the woman came to Saul and saw that he was really frightened. She said, Look, I, your servant, have obeyed you. I have risked my life and done what you told me to do. Now please listen to me. Let me get you some food so you may eat and have enough strength to go on your way. But Saul refused, saying, I won't eat. His servants joined the woman in asking him to eat, and he listened to them. So he got up from the ground and sat on the bed. At the house of the woman, at the house, the woman had a fat calf which she quickly killed. She took some flour and mixed dough with her hands. Then she baked some bread without yeast. She put the food before them and they ate. That same night, they got up and left. Thank you. There's a lot of weird, weird stuff in this chapter. If you say to yourself, "I have no idea what just happened," you would be in good company. Um, so, what do you take from this chapter? Yeah, Saul is desperate. Love it. He's given up to any any means. Samuel's dead, and he's all alone. <clears throat> God's not talking to him. He just makes so many mistakes in a row. It's just like shocking. It's almost. It, I mean, you feel for the guy. You're like, you're just so, yeah. spiraling out like of control. He bows in front of Samuel, and I'm like, you know, all this stuff is wrong. You're going to fortune mm-hmm. teller. You bow in front of the wrong person. Let's talk like, about that. Let's talk about that. That was so illegal. Going to divination, going to, to mediums. Let's talk about the terminology. Divination means what? What does divination mean? Just, just say divine. what you think. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Say it again. Something divine. Here. Some, yes, <laughs> using d- divine uh, or, or spiritual means to do what? Send a message. Send a message. Ask for something. Ask for something. Conjure. Conjure. What you know? What what is it that people are always interested in when they go to a fortune teller? Mm. The future. The future. Tell me about the future. Many places in the law, the Torah, God absolutely forbids this. Leviticus 19. 
Leviticus 20, Leviticus 27, Deuteronomy 18, uh, Isaiah 15, shall I go on? Does God like divination? Absolutely 100% not. In fact, he makes it very clear in the law, if you do that, you are going to be what? Put to death. This is not just a, don't do that again, uh, you naughty person. This is a, a clear threat to the people of God because it is a threat to their belief system. And to what? When you're putting your trust in a medium, who are you not putting your trust in? God. I have very easy answers. You know, it's, I'm thro throwing softballs. <clears throat> in fact, at one point, <laughs> You know, as you read the, the narrative here, Saul, Saul had done what? In verse 3, Saul had what? Forced them all out. Yeah, he'd cleaned the, the nation of these you know, people. Had he? Well, <laughs> so she was on the border. Uh, Sent him into <laughs> hiding, at least. Here's my point. When, when he said, I need a medium, what A, what did that imply to you? That he knew they were still around. And B, when his men said, oh, there's one in Endor, what did that tell you? <laughs> they knew about it too. Folks. And they're still practicing. The, 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 the narrative of, I'm going to clean up corruption and I'm going to fix all of the problems with our society has been around for 3,000 years at least. They say, leaders say all kinds of things, and they know darn well that it's not fixed. They know darn well it's not fixed. You know, you can apply that in your own life, too. Yep, it thank you. Just leaders, it can be, yep. I am against pornography. Yep. And the whole time, you know, in the back of your mind, you, you kind of have your own little secret That's thing it. going on, or pick your vice. Yep. You can preach on the mm -hmm. soapbox all you want, yep. um, but you, you, you can't have the, the side gig going. That's it. Side hustle like that. Divination can be sometimes done. There's many ways that people would practice divination. One of them that I've talked about in this class is the, is the practice of taking the entrails of certain animals, cutting an animal open, spreading their entrails out, and reading from them. Okay, um, That happens a lot in antiquity. I think you have to remember, in antiquity, this was absolutely 100% common. Almost every village and every town and every person you would ever meet would know someone that could do this kind of thing. Why? Because people are desperate. I, I'm answering for you. Why? Well, people, people have desperate. a spiritual... <laughs> Get the gold star. Desperate for what? What are they desperate for? Hope in it, you Hope. know, and just, yeah. Life would suck back then. I mean, you just think about what, the, what they go through on a daily basis just to get through a day. My wife is giving birth to our child and she's about to die. Some, some people, some thugs came and stole all of our cattle. Um, my other children are sick. They're coughing and I don't know what's wrong with them. Every One of them's died. You gotta kill them. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You need to know. Yeah, exactly. You can't just go down the wall. It's work. And how, it's how, and, and again, I like to say, you know, what do humans like? They like the easiest solution possible. What's an easy solution? Let me just go just ask someone. Have someone just tell me what, yeah, tell what to me. do. Just tell we've, me. We've always wanted understanding before yeah. God. Yeah. God will tell us when we need to know yeah. and we want to know. This is for the young people as much as the, the, the rest of us. Um, the hardest thing you will ever do in your life is have to trust God. That is the whole point of this book that we call the Bible, is thousands of pages and, and tens of thousands of words that all say the same thing. Trust me, trust me. It's not easy. God himself says it, I get it. It's not easy, but it can be if you let it. Trust me. And what is the hardest thing that humans, humans by their innate nature want to what? Show. We want to we want to rule the world, man. <laughs> Everybody wants to rule the world. One of my favorite songs of all time. <laughs> Tears for fears, man. Tears for fears. I love that song because it is 100% true. I don't care who you are on this planet. You want some measure of control over the world. Now, you may not want to run the entire world. You may just want to run your own life. 
And it's the hardest thing in the world to give that up. And God knew it. And he knew that if you were willing to say, Brian Freeman, don't try and run your own life. Do the best you can, but trust me, God, with the rest. I will make it work. But it's so hard. It's so hard to do that. So we run back to someone who will do it for us. Necromancy was a very common way in the past to do this kind of thing. What is necromancy? Something dead things. Necro of death. Bringing the dead back. Talking to spirits. How many people have seen the Ouija board or t seen the movie about Ouija boards? Right? What do you do? Yeah, to be honest. I, of course, I was in middle school. I've played with the things. It's a terrible idea, but I've done it. Um, what do you do? You and your friends sit around. You've had a little too much Mountain Dew. <coughs> You're sitting there and you put your hand on some kind of like device and you ask the spirits questions. Spirits, uh, does this girl I like really like me? And all of a sudden it starts to move, right? And N? <laughs> we're going the wrong way here. <laughs> but that's it, right? Everyone is, we're convinced that we can talk to the spirit world and they will give us answers back. Now, God is usually very clear about this. When you are asking the spirits questions, first of all, you are committing a sin because you're doing what he doesn't want you to do. If you do get an answer, and it may, you know, Ouija boards are, are, are hokey anyway, but we still do this, maybe unknowingly, through astrology. What is my, what is my astrological, um, you know, uh, sign and, and what is my fortune, right? What does the newspaper now online say, if I'm an Aquarius, what can I look forward to this week, right? I am, I am essentially doing this. I am trying to talk to the dead or to spirits to give me an answer. Are there spirits in the universe? Yes. 100% yes. If you get an answer from them, who is talking to you? <laughs> the devil. The dude with horns. <laughs> this isn't the guy that you want to trust with the answer. What? Hard to believe. You may get an answer. There are absolutely, folks, spiritual battles going on. But God is clear. Those spirits aren't going to give you an answer. Angels aren't going to give you an answer unless I send them. Demons aren't going to give you. What's it, what if a demon gives you an answer? What, are you going to trust that? No, no. We're good shaking our heads. Good Say it chance. again. Good, there's a good chance of it, though. We might. We will. Why? Because they're going to give us an answer. We what? Because we need to understand. We want to hear. hear. It's that. It's that. It's exactly that. What? The people that give you the answer that you want to hear often is not the right answer. Now, I am sorry <laughs> if that destroys your worldview. And there are many churches. In our own society today, that if you go to, they will give you answers you want to hear. Sometimes they're right. Many times they're wrong. Not a good idea. And a medium, of course, is a diviner who uses necromancy to answer questions. So all of this is a really bad idea. Stay far, far, far away from all of it. Now we have the most perplexing spiritual event in the entire Bible. Now, I'm not going to lie to you about this. If you were to ask 10 scholars what happened here, you will get 20 answers. Was it Samuel that came up out of the ground? I'm going to ask you folks that. I think it totally was. <coughs> I think it was Why do you God. Think that? It was God. <laughs> because the, the, this medium, boy, did she get an awakening. It's like, holy crap, this is different. This is different than <coughs> the people I know. I, I know who I call on. This guy's different. It says she screamed. I mean, I don't think she usually screams in her normal everyday <laughs> yeah. job. Yeah. She knows what's going to happen usually. Medium is terrified. That is your first big clue. Why? And then she said, why have you tricked me? She already yeah. knows he's solved <coughs> at that very moment. Also, it says it was Samuel, so... Okay, so that is an excellent point, Carrie, and I want to talk about that. Remember, remember, always ask yourself, who wrote it? Who were they writing to and why were they writing it? For the author of this passage, do they believe that it's Samuel? Yes. I think 100% yes. Now, again, I want to I want to talk about the reasons why we think that. Why do you think that? Well, we already know the medium was terrified. What else is going to happen here? Tell me everything else you know. Sam is going to die. One of his uh, sons. 
I don't think that's what he wanted to hear. Correctly <laughs> predicts the future. Okay. Yep. It wasn't what he wanted to hear. I'm answering for you. Stop it. Uh. Samuel is very uh, upset and uh, put out by this. Why are you disturbing me? Yep. And Samuel also brings up what he'd already talked about with Saul, which other people may or yes. may not know. Yes. I don't know. Correctly um, reviews the past. Plus, he, rec he recognized him physically. <clears throat> It's so funny. The woman says, an old man wearing a coat is coming up. Then Saul knew it was Samuel. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I referred to. That's great. Okay. <coughs> that's great. She didn't even There's know. no other old man wearing coats. Because yeah, he, yeah, he had a robot. <laughs> yeah. How many yeah, times do you go to a fortune teller? I mean, even in the movies or whatever, go to a fortune teller and your mom is telling you this from the grave, right? Your uncle is going to leave you a lot of money. I don't know. They always know who it is that's talking. In this case, she didn't know until this happened. And she's terrified. What else? I, I think we're really getting onto it here that it seems to be the preponderance of, of information here is that it seems to be Samuel. This is, a, this is hard to wrestle with because, and, and if you've been in my class before, we talk a lot about what was the afterlife for the Israelites? Now that may, you may think there's an easy answer to that because why? For a Christian, what is the afterlife? Heaven. Heaven. Paradise or? Heaven. Or, yeah, we, we recognize that yeah. there is an afterlife. You physically, what? When, when you die, there is what? Tell me the sequence of events. You die, and then what happens? Soul goes to heaven. Okay, potentially there is some kind of intermediate period. Yeah. yeah. And then what? What happens in Revelation? Oh, well, then heaven on earth. Judgment. Judgment day. Judgment day, what happens? What happens to all the dead people? They rise. Just the good ones? No. Nope. Everybody rises from the dead, folks. Everybody. Universal resurrection and then a judgment where you go before the creator of the universe and he says to you, Blessed Violet, I knew you. You may enter with me into paradise. Welcome. Or for the people who never gave their life to Jesus, who never tried to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the, the true Son of God, or, and or lived their life so wickedly as to reject Jesus and his teachings, he says to you, I don't know you. I've never known you. For you, it is reserved everlasting punishment, and you go to everlasting punishment. For a Christian, we understand what the end game is. In the Old Testament, it's not very clear and in fact, most scholars say the afterlife was, was undefined. Why was the afterlife undefined in the Old Testament? Jesus hadn't come yet. Yes. He hadn't set up the kingdom. Hasn't, the answer hasn't been revealed. And a lot of us wrestle with that. Like, well, what happens to the Jews? Look, there are answers in the Bible, and we'll talk about that in a separate thing. But what happens when you die as a, as a Hebrew, at least to the, uh, to the Hebrews in the Old Testament, was you go to a place called Sheol, which is essentially the realm of the dead. A place where you are, quote, gathered to your forefathers or gathered to your ancestors, and you await there. And it's not really clear what's going on in this realm. And it's not really clear um, if, if the people in that realm are communicating. Sometimes it seems they are, sometimes it seems they're not. It seems to be this kind of quiescent state where maybe it's kind of a holding, a holding pattern. And, and as a Christian, you look back on that and go, well, it's clear. God is waiting to reveal the answer to everlasting life because there was no answer. It was a problem with no answer yet. But in this particular passage, it seems, God has miraculously called upon Samuel to come back and to talk to Saul. Now, is God capable of doing this? Yeah. Well, God is God. Yeah. He's in charge of the universe. He can do it whatever he darn well pleases. <clears throat> and in this case, it seems, the one person who Saul would listen to and believe was who? Samuel. You know, I think God does things for a reason. And he's not arbitrary. And he probably knew that Samuel would only listen, Saul would only listen to Samuel because, as we've known, he came seeking Samuel even though they had a very contentious 
life, especially after Samuel anointed the other guy, it's clear that Saul really only recognized Samuel as being the only authoritative prophet of God. And so, seems God makes Samuel available. Seems as he's run out of people to trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of well. funny that God didn't have to do this. Mm. You know, he wouldn't answer him by the way that he normally would speak to Saul or speak to anyone in general. Like, he would speak to people through prophets and dreams and the unum and the thurnum or whatever. Mm -hmm. And God didn't answer him that way. And then Saul goes to this desperate measure mm -hmm which God had no need or, you know, he knew Saul was going to die the next day. Mm -hmm. He didn't even have to tell him that yeah. it was going to happen. But I don't yeah. know, it's kind of like, I feel like God's being kind to Saul yeah. in this way by letting him, I don't know. I, don't know. I still don't know. It's <laughs> yeah. kind of weird, but. Call up, call up hey, by the way, you man, the, yeah. <laughs> speak of your impending death. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was Saul. Samuel? Or Samuel. Okay. Because uh, Samuel apparently received worship, and I don't think Samuel would have done that. And you know what? To be honest, Jeremy, you, you, know, you, would, you would be equally right in, in justifying the fact that this wasn't Samuel. Um, it might have been the appearance of Samuel. Um, <clears throat> The question is, is this divine? Is this something that God himself is allowing to happen? Maybe that's the better question. Because really, in the end of the day, it's kind of irrelevant whether this was Samuel or not. And this is a good example of how people tend to find things in the Bible they want to go off on a tangent and argue about that have nothing to do with the actual point. The actual point was what here? The kingdom was taken away from Saul. Because why? Because he wasn't obey, did not obey what he said. Saul thought God abandoned him, so he... He just still couldn't accept it, and he wasn't, huh? you know. <laughs> Samuel doesn't tell him any brand new information here, really, except for the fact that he's going to, like, die the next day. But he knew he'd die eventually at some point, right? You know, so, I mean... Gosh, this is another good point. But Saul just cannot... Like, when he, God's not answering him, he's like... God already has taken his spirit from you. Like, you already know the writing on the wall, what is, Saul. Like, what does this say about you? This is for our, do you already know what the truth is? Do you know the truth? Does a, does a three-year-old who looks at you as they go to the candy jar know right and wrong? You better believe it. It is written into your heart and your mind. You know right from wrong, from almost birth, from, from very nearly birth. Saul knew the right answer. How many times have you asked God and he's given you the same answer? What if you didn't like it? Mm -hmm. well, go talk to these people. Yeah, try to take things into our own hands. Yeah. I like the answer. And, and I think and there's many answers here. Yeah. I think that, you know, for me anyway, I mean, I'll just say it from my point of view is it's very easy when you think God has abandoned you to what? Abandon God. Well, I'm not going to go to church anymore. I'm going to diss on Christians. I have, I'll just be honest, a family member who was recruited by her, <clears throat> by her church to become a youth group leader. Now, there's a lot of side notions about this. <clears throat> um, it turns out she was living with um, <clears throat> a man who was not her husband, and the person in charge of that church did not know that until after he had asked her to become a youth group leader, which has its own like red flags. <clears throat> but when he found out, he told her, you are no longer a candidate to be a youth group leader because you are living in a, a non-marriage situation with a man that's not your husband. <clears throat> and I'm taking this out of the video, by the way. <laughs> this is your chance. This is your chance. She responded by burning the church on Facebook. How dare that priest of mine do that to me? I am in a loving, committed relationship with this man, and he doesn't understand anything, and he's just being a bigot, and he's being hateful, and I will probably never darken the doorstep of that church again. That was the wrong answer, folks. That was 100% the wrong answer. She got an answer she didn't like, so what does she do? She burned God in the church. 
She had over 150 responses to her face. This is one reason I got rid of Facebook. I can't stand it. She had over 150 responses to that post, almost all of them universally, that negative, like angry face that you have. How much damage did she do to God's church in that? What should she have done? She should have said, you're right, priest. I was wrong. I repent. And I'm sorry. Maybe he was right all along. She shouldn't. She, he was, the priest was on to something. She was not the material that you want or I want leading our children. Now, she might change in the future. And this is the great thing about God, folks. You can always change. You can always change. But in that moment, made it very clear, she didn't like the answer that she got from God, so she was going to abandon God and she was going to burn the church. Okay? Okay, now this is the part of the video. We'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to be really careful about how you react to what God tells you. And, and we have had this conversation in this class many times. You can absolutely go to God every single day. You are reading your Bible every day. This is for the young people too. Reading your Bible every day. You are praying every day to God of the universe who is there and is listening to you. But if you ask him for things... God, please give me this, or please give me that, or please help me understand this or that. Sometimes he's going to give you answers you don't like. Does that mean it's time to ditch God? I give a lot of easy answers here. <laughs> okay. You're going, get, you're going to get a lot of answers you don't like. That's it. You're not just going to get some. That's it. Most of the answers you are not going to like because you are not inherently good. Mm -hmm. But is God doing it to punish you? No. Is God doing it because he doesn't like you? Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe you're getting punished. Maybe. Yeah, but punished. is God doing it because he inherently hates you? No. no. Or doesn't want the best for you. <clears throat> That's it. He wants the best for you. So what you're asking for is probably or may not be in your best interest or in the interest, best interest of your children or future generations or, you know, whatever, whatever big picture is that God knows that we don't know. You have children or you were a child <clears throat> once. How many times did you go to your parents and ask them for something and they told you no? Was that because they hated you? Somewhere in the New Testament said God disciplines those he loves. Yeah. I, I, I don't believe he punishes us. It feels like punishment. Because yep. we understand that as in the earthly realm. I'm punishing my child for doing this. But I'm not. I'm, not, I'm disciplining. Yep. All right. This is intense. Any final thoughts today? The Witch of Endor. What a, what a crazy chapter. We're almost there. We're almost done with this. The end game is, is upon us here for David and, and Saul. And so we'll pick this up next week. I think next week we'll just finish up 1 Samuel and talk about kind of the, the wrap up here <clears throat> and then where we go from there. So thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.